and it usually it takes like a little a few minutes to kind of you know cool for the streaming to catch up don't look at Looks the like spoilers <laughs> i already read some of them no they I were good you. they were good they were good <laughs> Okay, so I guess we'll just uh, take it from wherever you want, and uh, okay. here we we can, yeah, go for it. Thank you, Morgan. Cool. Okay, so I just started recording, so just in case people are starting to watch after the fact, and they're watching this recording, we'll just say, I went over everything at this on this slide. I'm credible. And also, we had some technical difficulties, so we're going from there. Sorry to everyone in the chat. I promise. Uh, I hope. I hope it won't happen again. Uh, just want to make sure. Connor Nacho is the stream okay? Is it good? Uh, yeah, we can see it. Woohoo! Yeah, okay, Go cool. for it. I'm a playwright with a lot of improv in my background. Don't look. Spoilers. Okay. Why do I personally enjoy playwriting? I think writing is good for you. I think it's healthy for your spirit um, versus other types of writing. I really enjoy how organic it can be. Um, I really enjoy the deconstruction of human interpersonal interaction. I was a communication major, um, so that's where that comes from. And by human interpersonal interaction, what I mean is one-on-one -on -one communication, small group communication. Um, in playwriting, there's a lot less of a, in my experience, a standard for how it should be. The industry standards are a lot more flexible, um, whereas in screenwriting, I feel like there's the whole save the cat. You know, you want to have your structure be the exact same way pretty much every single time, and riffs on that structure are they have to be very, very intentional. Um, and I'll get more into playwriting versus screenwriting later. Uh, this link, uh, I'll post it in the chat afterward, but that's just a lecture from Brandon Sanderson. He's uh, like a super good fantasy writer and he, um, he has amazing, uh, let me fix this real quick. There we go. He has some amazing lectures that he does, and uh, I just really recommend watching them um, because I'm going to be regurgitating a lot of what he says. <laughs> what are my goals for you guys in this class? Um, what I want in proper boot camp fashion is for you guys to be able to write compelling scenes of dialogue really fast. Again, improv background. I'm used to making scenes with just a tiniest bit of inspiration and get to um, uh, compelling uh, arc with the characters and a payoff as quickly as possible. Um, my writing style is very discovery based, um, which I'll get into later rather than, you know, a lot of planning involved before writing. Um, I want you to be able to take just like a few lines of dialogue and be able to make entire plays or scenes based on that tiny bit of inspiration. Tangibly, I want you guys to be able to have a one act play by the end of these six weeks. By one act play, um, I mean a script anywhere between 10 pages and about 60 pages. This is another area where playwriting is a bit more flexible. Um, movies, you generally want to write between like 80 and 110 pages. With playwriting, um, there's a ton of opportunities to write between like 10 and like 150 pages. Cool. Let's keep on going do, do, do. just gonna check the chat okay great what I 
I'm not necessarily looking for is for you guys to entirely adopt my approach at the end of this. What I would love is for my approach to be sort of like a tool in your toolbox that you carry with you. If it resonates with you and you totally want to take it on, that's great, but everyone has a different experience in life and therefore something different is going to work for everyone. Because of my experience and because of my background, this is the approach that works for me. I couldn't teach any other approach or else I wouldn't do a very good job teaching it. Um, so basically what I want for you guys to do is just to learn all you can about this approach and then go from there and sort of develop your own style. Um, so this is a quote from George R. R. Martin. You might have heard of him. He wrote something called like Game of Thrones or something um, about how there's two types of writers, architects and gardeners. Architects in real life, they need the blueprints for the house uh, before they even begin to build it. Um, they plan everything out. They know exactly what's going to happen and then they start. Where a gardener they don't know what their finished product is going to look like in the end. They've got seeds, they bought the right seeds, they have water, they make sure their plants have enough water and sunlight, they make sure the soil is fertilized, but at the end of the day, they don't know what the plants are going to look like. They hope it's great, but they don't know. They don't ex know exactly where it's going. And I am more of a gardener than an architect. A lot of you guys probably have experience with Connor's classes. He is a huge architect. So if you're taking this class after taking a few of Connor's classes, this, it might be kind of confusing at first, but bear with me. If, uh, if you're more of a gardener, I think this class will resonate with you quite a bit. We'll see how it goes. Um, all right. All right, here's some more comparisons. Architects, they plan everything first. They outline, 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 outline. Um, when I screenwrite, I also outline. It's much harder to be a gardener with screenwriting. I think playwriting is much more conducive to gardening than um, screenwriting is. Uh, architects will figure out the plot often, and then they will figure out characters that are suitable to those circumstances. So um, let's say you're writing a, a movie about uh, <laughs> um, a children's soccer team. They're trying to win the championship. The characters that you put in there is might be... Um, a wimpy girl with asthma who's not that athletic. Therefore, she fits the plot because it's going to be compelling to watch her sort of triumph over the circumstance of her own uh, weaknesses. Uh, gardeners often will figure out characters, the histories with their characters, their backgrounds, their internal life, and then they will sort of organically develop a plot based on what those characters would naturally do, what actions those characters would naturally take based on their internal life. Um, I will frequently spend a long time just thinking about my characters and take to the page before I even feel ready, um, before I even know what's going to happen in the end of my plays. Uh, because what I need to do is, through the process of writing, figure out like the voice and the tone of my characters, figure out what they would naturally do, and then from there I start to develop the plot. Um, what I frequently do, going back to the one act thing, is I'll write a 10 minute play just with the characters to kind of figure out their voices, and then after I'm done with that 10 minute play, I'll then take those characters and expand it into a full length play. I honestly don't know who E.L. Doctorow is. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. But I saw this quote a long time ago and it really resonated with me. Writing is like driving at night in the fog. You can only see as far as your headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. Um, that is how I write. I don't know what's going to happen in the end. But I kind of know where I'm going next. And I know enough about the characters to trust myself that or I will be able to organically 
write them uh, and, and write in a way that feels natural to them. Yeah, yeah, Stephen King is definitely in a, a gardener as well. I think, I think he's a self-acclaimed gardener. Almost, I'm totally getting that wrong. Um, it's Tolkien almost the same thing. Interesting. All right. So, Morgan, while you're paused, just really quick, if you could, yeah. in, in the bottom right where it says a screen on Discord, click on that. And um, if you can maybe try, if it's set to, or maybe Nacho can explain this better, but maybe if we can change the stream quality, people are just having a little trouble reading the text. Oh, um, okay. So, I can also make the text bigger and just get rid of myself, <laughs> if that's easier. No, no, no. <laughs> no uh, just where it says uh, 60 FPS. If you, you may want to change it down to 30 FPS. Okay. If everyone else could just keep their mics muted, um, unless there are calls. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, please. Uh, That's okay. Um, so yeah, go ahead and check the, uh, check the, check, do you see where it has the quality settings? Yeah, it says 60 FPS. Um, change it to 30. <laughs> oh God. It says, um, Unlock HD video streaming with Discord Nitro. Oh, okay. Is that maybe I will can't? that maybe prevent her from doing Sorry, it? Nacho? Let's see. Options. No, you're 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 already at sixty, but you can just go down to thirty. It'll be a little bit. Should be a little bit. Oh. I think she's saying it's it doesn't let her. Oh, do, will it let you downgrade it? Hang on. Just just look for the sixty and then change it to thirty. I see where it says HP. Stream quality thirty. Ha ha! Is that okay? Is that better? Um, I can't I tell quite yet, but um, hopefully that'll help a little. I think your connection okay. at your place is maybe not the best, also. So there might be. Oh, that, yeah, that looks a little better to me. But um, if and if you get to a point where you're reading out the chat, you can always just make the chat bigger temporarily by just dragging it out. Cool. Um, so just if if that comes Ooh. up, and you can. Help us out. Yeah, there you go. Ooh, so if you, if you, that's perfect. So it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that is a solution. That's the should work. Hobbit. Okay. Cool. Sorry about the technical difficulties, guys. Maybe next time I'll have to like move to a different place in my house, but I haven't had much luck in other places in my house. Maybe I can go to somebody else's house. Um, okay. Playwriting versus screenwriting. Um, so I said I would talk about this a little bit earlier. This is all in my experience. Uh, maybe Connor has a different experience uh, than me. You know, if you foray into this, maybe you'll have a different experience than me. But personally, I've noticed in playwriting, submission costs are lower um, and there's less competition. That being said, you're competing against like hundreds of people versus thousands of people. So no matter what, there's still like a ton of competition. Um, in screenwriting, there's almost this whole screenwriting competition industry. Like it feels like there's a whole industry that is dedicated to specifically screenwriters who are trying to break in and making money off of them. Um, Screencraft, which is like the big one. Um, $70 per submission and then $70 for feedback. That's like you need a whole budget just to even try to become a screenwriter. Um, and then, like I said, there's this whole market in the playwriting community for 10-minute plays. So that's great. If you just Google 10-minute play submissions, 10-minute play competitions, you'll find that. That's so good for new writers because you maybe don't you're maybe not ready to write an entire play yet, but if you have something that's just 10 minutes long, you can find a market for your scripts. There's tons of festivals, especially online these days. I feel like there's a ton of 10 minute online virtual play festivals. Um, in theater, the playwright is revered. Think William Shakespeare, everyone loves him. You know, you're welcome in rehearsals to go have your voice heard. Um, directors will often listen to your perspective on how you think um, your uh, vision should be uh, portrayed, um, whereas screenwriters are really lucky if they're invited to film shoots. Um, uh, it doesn't really happen so much. In playwriting, 
a, a completed stage play is it's a completed piece of literature people read those for fun um even people who don't write plays they read plays for fun you can sell plays in a bookstore um in the film industry a completed screenplay is not really seen as a completed work of literature it's mostly just seen as fodder for your portfolio um the only people who read screenplays for fun are really just other screenwriters um most people aren't gonna just read a screenplay for fun in a uh, theater it's a lot of older older people um so while you can like i said earlier you can get experimental with things like format and you can kind of be weirder and more organic there's there is a market for those weird or organic type plays you have to be careful because a lot of theater is older people who like traditional things they like the they like shakespeare they like the fantastics they like old school musicals so if if that's something you're interested in is writing something more conventional more traditional you just have to look for the theater companies that are interested in putting those types of things on um so just always look at like the mission of the theater company that you're submitting to and check out what's the tone that they're going for with their seasons of things that they put on covid i feel like that's just important to talk about because in keeping with the fact that most theater people are older, theater has been a lot slower to get back to normal after COVID, just because obviously older people are more susceptible to getting the virus and they wanna be more careful about um, that, you know, being safe about the pandemic. Um, Production-wise, um, this is an important thing to think about. Um, once a play is performed, it's gone forever. Whereas your script is forever and you can get that published if you want and people can read that forever long after you die. The production, once it's performed, unless it's a special occasion where it's being filmed, it's gone forever, like it's done. On the other hand, in movies, the movie will last forever. Whereas the script, if it doesn't get performed, will be gone. Um, so there's sort of an interesting um, flip there between the two industries. Um, in theater, you're writing something to be performed over multiple, multiple iterations forever. Um, so think of like Shakespeare's performed like probably hundreds of times every single year. Um, not saying that, you know, we're going to be like Shakespeare, but like when you write something, your hope is that it will be performed multiple times so you want to be kind of flexible with the image that you have in your head of how things are going to go um whereas a movie might get made twice if it's a remake or um like uh certain movies if, if there's uh, if it's made in one country but they want to make it in a different language then it'll be performed twice um in those sort of situations um, your first, um, I'm just checking out the chat, see if, uh, yeah, all right, let's keep going. Um, again, I just want to say writing is good for you. If you're getting your story out there and playwriting is the medium that you think is right for you, then you're succeeding at it. You're doing a good job. Just if you finished writing a play, you're doing better than like almost everybody who wants to be a writer. <laughs> we'll just put it that way. Um, the writing itself, um, playwriting versus screenwriting, movie scenes are like two minutes long max, maybe like three minutes if it's like a really important scene. Playwriting, personally, I often write plays that don't switch scenes at all. The entire play is one scene. So it's the craft of having dialogue happen for 60 minutes with no change of setting. You're in the same place, it's the same time, the entire time. 
In playwriting, you want to show by telling. Let's say um, in a movie, a character walks in and they see a letter on a table and it says to Carl. Um, they look at it, they look kind of confused. It's in sort of like scraggly handwriting. That's the beginning of that scene in the movie. In a play, if you want to write that scene, you can't have the subtlety of just having the character look confused. You can't see the writing that's on this letter um, because the audience is going to be way, way far away. So you might have to have the character say, hmm, to Carl. That's weird. Uh, being an improviser, I always feel the need to like set down my like pretend props. It's so stupid. Um, <laughs> Uh, and in that, playwriting is a lot more forgiving of the characters talking to themselves. You'll find something called the soliloquy, where the character is just by themselves, feeling their feelings through a monologue, talking to themselves, talking about their own feelings. Ugh, oh, I love it. Subtlety. That's very tricky in playwriting. Um, like I said, you can't have the character look at the thing and, and just furrow their eyebrows like you would in a movie. You can't have those fun camera zooms to have something to make a, a facial expression be more compelling. Camera zooms, dollies, all that stuff. You can't have like the lighting change or music. I mean, I guess you could have music in a play. Um, but it just makes subtlety a bit trickier. In playwriting, you want monologues. That's how you show your characters really feeling a feeling. Monologues. Um, in playwriting, you frequently want to have intermissions. You know, if your play is longer than uh, 90 minutes, um, you probably want to give the audience a break so that they can get a snack and go pee. Um, that being said, um, I feel like the industry... The younger people of the industry are starting to move away from mono, from uh, intermissions. Um, that said, uh, the older, more traditionalists of the industry are, are going to want um, intermissions. Fourth wall breaks. That's where the character is talking to the audience uh, in um, like House of Cards. Maybe not the best example in light of you know certain actors is um abuse but uh that main character he would look into the camera and talk um that's not as common in movies and tv but in theater it's pretty common especially in like fun comedies and musicals the characters are frequently um they're doing what's called asides to the audience where you know they say something to one character and then they lean into the audience and they say but this is really what i'm thinking um, and how does audience imagination play into this? Um, frequently what you'll see in a play, um, like let's say you have a, a scene with like a bunch of combat. Um, you might have the character uh, running slow motion into battle. Um, the stage combat is tricky while they're explaining what's happening. Uh, whereas in a, a movie you might have... Um, voiceover um uh the play pillow man i think is a good example of audience imagination um i don't know if any of you guys have read it um uh but a lot of the characters monologue and they explain these really cool fantastical fairy tale stories and you don't see those happening on stage but you see the actor acting it out, and that's what's compelling, is you're seeing the actor, not acting out the events of the stories, but acting out the emotions associated with the stories in a way, I think it's really cool. Um, and the audience is sort of sitting there imagining the stories, supplementing the information of the stories with their own imagination, with the emotion played by the character, and that's enough. You don't necessarily need to see um, the stories happening. Um, does anybody um, 
have an example of, uh, ooh, not meaning to do that. Um, an example of um, something they saw on stage that maybe couldn't really work in a movie or something they saw in a movie that wouldn't necessarily work on stage. Um, feel free to just talk in the channel or type in the chat. For, I know being a student myself, it's kind of, um, oh, interesting. Um, interacting with studio audience. That's interesting, because like in sitcoms, it's sort of like this hybrid, right? Of um, <laughs> Spider-Man can't work on stage. That's actually an interesting point, because isn't there Spider-Man the musical? Um, you're right that like in the plays that, for our purposes, the plays that we're writing, we probably wouldn't want to write something like Spider-Man because the assumed production budget is going to be pretty small. Um, so we couldn't really have people like scaling buildings and stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm getting so many. Um, but so I want to go back to um, somebody mentioned studio audience. I think that's an, actually a really interesting point because in those like, uh, like three camera uh, sitcoms, it's... It's like an interesting hybrid because they are sort of performing to the studio audience, but they're performing mostly to the cameras. And then you get that feedback of the laughter. Um, it's like an interesting hybrid. Oh, um, you can also have characters. I think what he may have been referring to is sometimes you can have characters like go out into the audience um, and like, you know, continue a scene yeah. from the aisles or like exit via not the stage, but via the doors to the theater or things like that. Yeah, that's are all true. devices that you can just you just there's no way to do that. Anything even similar to that in a movie. Yeah, you can't really do that in a movie. It's kind of you, you get audience interaction in, in a cool way um, in or have, or have a character sit be sitting in the audience. Yeah, I've done that. Uh, I was in a production of the Fantastics where uh, I didn't start in the audience, but they had a few of the characters like start in the audience, like pretending to be seeing the show. I mean, I think it was like pretty obvious that they're in the show because of the way they were dressed, but it's like kind of fun. Um, <laughs> All right, a Spider-Man play just prove you all wrong. That's hilarious. I really, I do think there was like a Spider-Man on Broadway. I'm not sure. There's Spider, yeah, Turn Off the Dark is what it was called. Yeah, there's by, a Spider-Man uh, on Broadway. <laughs> It existed, technically. Yeah, yeah. I think um, a lot of people got hurt in that one. <laughs> but there were a lot of no, mistakes. In, that, uh, that, uh, that should God. deter you from writing your own version of Spider-Man, because, like... Yeah, I, I had an idea about a more limited approach, like like I him so saving a robbery from stopping a robbery at a convenience store or something. I think you should do it. That sounds great. <laughs> um... <laughs> To put it simply, a lot of playwriting is finding common ways to express common human emotions in the most compelling way possible through dialogue. Your bread and butter of playwriting, I don't know if I'm using that phrase correctly, is dialogue. Um, or monologues, which I always feel like is a type of dialogue, but I guess not technically. Um, you know, you can't have the camera zooms. You can't have the subtle, like, oh, he left a, you know, he left a tiny little thing in the corner of the room. That's not going to be easy to see from a stage. So you have to say things out loud. But it's not as fun to have them say, I'm leaving, um, I'm leaving my mother's favorite pen on this table. They, and they leave it there. That's not fun to hear. You want to find a compelling way to say that. So that's what this class is going to be all about. Um, what time is it? It's 2.42. We're not going to watch these videos because I'm a bit worried about time. We'll, we'll, it, just because of all the, those issues that we had before. Um, we'll, we'll come back to these videos at the end if we have time. But Let's also leave the links if you want. Yeah, I'll leave the I'll there. leave the links in the chat at the end. Um, I don't want to I don't want to leave spoilers by exiting out of out of this. But okay, so basically, to be or not to be, that is the question. Everybody knows that line, right? Um, 
I would hope so. You know, I feel like that's expressing the common human emotion of despair. Me and Connor actually talked about this before class. I was like, I feel like the human, I feel like everyone or almost everyone is suicidal like once, right? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. Talk about it in the chat. We hope you're not. Uh, yeah, I guess. But not. like, <laughs> it's I guess it's a common human emotion in that it's sort of this is one of the b sort of big theatrical monologues that has stood the test of time because it is something that has occurred to everyone. It, exactly. I feel like every it's a the the possibility has occurred to everyone, and the reason I have um, these two different ones posted is because there's a Benedict Cumberbatch video there. Um, you know, I feel like everyone knows who's, who's Benedict Cumberbatch is. But he performs To Be or Not To Be, that monologue. And then uh, Ben Winshaw also performed that monologue. But the way that they perform them is very, very different. And so I want to show you guys that you might write a monologue and people might have very different interpretations of the text. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, that's a very good thing um, because you want across the iterations of your piece some variance because that's what makes theater great um i am personally uh favorable to ben winshaw's uh sorry somebody talking i think someone just joined it was unsure what was going on we so feel free to write questions in the chat on the left hand side of your screen there's a chat channel called free playwriting class so morgan can take questions in there if you type them in yeah, it sounded robot-y. I, I couldn't understand exactly what you were saying, but... It might have been a robot, too. We don't know. Yeah, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch's version is very, um... Sort of like regal, like what you would expect from the son of a king. Um, ben Winshaw's version is so fragile and delicate, and uh, I love it so much. It's just like, you really feel his vulnerable despair oh my husband um this is the third one it was like on reddit a few weeks ago it was really good um and i just i'll, I'll post all of these at the end um this this one specifically it's very like raw it's it's almost cinematic like you'd expect this this type of performance in in a movie i, I would think it's very raw it's very real like, grounded um very very upsetting um, I just really, really quick, I want to go over format so quick, um, because I, you know, when I found out I was going to be teaching this class, I asked around to my friends, I said, uh, what should I go over in a playwriting class? And then a bunch of them said format, and I, I was surprised by this. Um, I think format is something that holds a lot of people back from starting. Um, in screenwriting, format matters a lot more than in playwriting. In playwriting, uh, there's not like a standardized playwriting format. Uh, you'll see different formats of plays everywhere, but the one I tend to see the most is American standard format. I would recommend that one. I'll show you guys that in a sec. Um, people get afraid of doing it wrong, but keep in mind... Format should help you, not hinder you. If you're struggling with format, you don't like what you're seeing on the page, change up what you're doing to just have it be a way that you enjoy. Like, at the end of the day, you should just enjoy what you're looking at on the page. You should look at the page and be like, okay, I can read this quickly. The actors are going to be able to quickly locate where their lines are. Um, I can fluidly pinpoint where the action is. I can find my own name, my character's name, and go from there. That's the goal. Efficiency and make it look pretty. Um, that being said, ugh, see, immediately I'm like, oh, it's so off center. Um, that's And I would fix that. If, if I was writing this play, I would go in and fix that. I think this is just a little format hiccup. Ugh, weird. Yeah, see, what what you'll find when you turn into the um, 
the first page of a script. You're going to find the title in the middle by the author's name. And then you're going to find the contact information in the corner. My name got cut off there, but it's all just fake information anyway. Um, after that, you're going to find a... Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm like clicking to the thing. You're going to find the cast of characters and the setting and the time. You might find a quote. You might find a little, like, information about the play. Immediately what sticks out to me about this. The underline extends past the words cast of characters. That drives me crazy. I hate that. I would go in and I would fix that. The setting, um, it could be in one place the whole time. So you want to say, um, you know, this takes place in a, you know, everybody loves their family kitchen drama. So, uh. You'll have to find dining room in uh, Toronto, Canada, um, or various locations in Detroit, Michigan, um, if you have multiple locations. Time, modern day, um, is if, if it's in the 60s. This is all to inform your production staff, you know, where it's going to be and what... Uh, uh, what time it's going to be because you want to know what time period it's going to be for the costumer um, dialect, things like that. And now you'll find um, probably the most garbage script I've ever written in my whole life um, just because I want to have a little format demonstration for you guys. Act 1, that is centered in the middle there. Scene 1, that is off to the side. I put a place because sometimes I'll have a place, but it is perfectly valid just to have scene one there. You don't need to have a place there. I Can you make it full screen, Marco? Yes. Let me do that for you. Thank you. And um, quick question about the cast list. How much detail do you want to include in the cast list? Because on yours, it was very sparse. And I've actually seen various types where some people will include just the age and the gender, and some will include, like more physical description or maybe even about how the character should be played? How would you advise on that? That's a super duper good question. Um, and this is where I would say the like flexibility of playwriting format factors in. Um, in it, it's kind of whatever your style is. Are you the kind of person that likes to have all that information right up front? Then totally do it. Are you the kind of person that likes to keep it sparse and then sort of elaborate on the character information in the script itself, totally do that. But I would say check the submission requirements for wherever you're submitting. Um, if you're submitting to a contest that just wants race, gender, age, um, just have race, gender, age. But if the contest you're submitting to or the theater that you're submitting to wants more information or you think based on like the mission of their company, that they're the kind of theater that's gonna want more information, then I would say put more. I think, um, uh, I tend to find personally that like putting more information is like the more old school style, but I mean, totally let me know what you guys find in the comments or if anybody here has um like a different experience uh with that just feel free to chime in now um uh but yeah <laughs> i'm like so wanting to like get past this slide just because this is so horribly written um okay yeah so i have uh, did that was that a, a good answer connor to your question yeah I, I think you're saying there's not one answer to that yeah. you can sort of like decide how much information you want to include but probably just be consistent for the whole cast list i would i would think right like exactly. if you're going to include yeah. a bunch of info on one person not everyone else should be like just their age right yeah you don't want to have like one character have a bunch of information and then have another character have just like man um you want to just be consistent probably um same thing with format, like do whatever you want with it, have your own riffs on the format, develop your own style, but keep it consistent, keep it legible, keep it efficient to read, and um, you're in the clear. Um, so yeah, I put a place 
for my scenes just because I like that. Um, and the thing I'm writing right now, I have titles for all my scenes because I like that. I think it's fun. Like that it'll be like, uh, usually I only have like one or two scenes in every single one of my plays. So I'll be like scene one, smoke, something like, you know, like pretentious like that. Um, and then a lot of people in the action lines right off the bat, they'll front load it. Um, they'll have a ton of information for the production staff to refer to. Um, they'll explain their entire setting. They'll explain like every single prop that's on stage right now. And they'll have little descriptions of the characters, what the characters are doing. I've seen plays that have this beginning action liney part be like paragraphs, if not pages long. Um, and that's perfectly valid. You can absolutely do that. Tons of people do that. If you're the kind of person that likes to do that, you should do that. Um, I tend to not do that because I am the kind of writer that likes to imply pace throughout my scripts. So, I mean, maybe if the beginning part is sort of a silent settling into the situation, like the characters start by in silence, just like performing some sort of task. I'll have it be like a few paragraphs because I want to imply that there's some silence at the top there. Um, but a lot of times I'll just get right into it and explain as I go. Um, because I personally use action lines to imply pace. Um, <laughs> God, this is so bad. Uh, character is centered in the middle there. Um, in European style format, you'll have that on the left, but American standard is usually what is most common. John says, I'm making a mess. He, he, that dialogue is going to be centered on the left. Parentheticals will, uh, do a little bit of further explaining to the tone of the way somebody's saying something, or maybe if they have a little action to go along with what they're saying. I would recommend not to overuse parentheticals. Every director is going to have a different philosophy on how much they prefer um, playwrights, how much they prefer playwrights to direct on the page. Um, I tend to direct a little bit. Some playwrights like to be bare bones and not direct uh, the character a little bit. Um, but again, that's like totally up to you. End act, same as beginning the act, centered, underlined, capitalized in the middle. Um, does anybody have any questions about format or anything that I just said? I'm just going to check the chat here. Um, Introducing new characters. Um, is it like in a, I've seen in some of your plays, you actually introduce them similarly to how you would in a movie script more often. But in, in a lot of plays you read off the shelf, it's going to be more just like, Dave enters, and we know who Dave is because you have to flip back to the cast list to know who that is, right? So how yeah. would you say to negotiate that? Um, that goes into personal style. So the people that um, the, the people that tend to like have huge character descriptions, like in that cast of characters sections, they're probably not going to elaborate too much of the, on the character once you get into the script itself because they've already explained it all. But because my character descriptions are pretty sparse, I tend to explain more. But that's that's like personal style. Um, I see. Um, is that so? The uh, it's heavier at the beginning. Is that so the reader can get a grasp of the character as they read, and by the time um, there's some of the way through the script, the action direction becomes redundant. Um, is the character? Um, so I was referring to at the beginning that there will be more, there will be heavier um, scene setting at the very top, um, and uh, or like there might be like a longer character introduction at the big at the beginning, for instance. Uh, but it depends on like how much you have front loaded that in. Like if if for instance you say in the setting on the front page you're like the the dingy back room of a Chicago hotel or something like that, then in the, when we get to the actual script they might not go into that much detail on the actual settings or for instance like just if you've set something up beforehand you don't always have to explain it we don't, we don't have to explain it again yeah exactly i see it different like all the time like i i read professional plays and plays written by uh like friends who are profes professional writers and it's 
it's like different every time. I feel like in playwriting, it's just nothing is quite as standardized as it is in screenwriting. So you can, um, I would say just as you're writing, you'll sort of develop what you prefer. And and um, this is a good time to say, I just suggest like reading plays. Um, I'll send a link to something called New Play Exchange. Um, that's a website, uh, I think you do have to pay, but it's only like $5 a year. Um, and you can just download plays written by professionals um, that, you know, they're not necessarily published yet, um, which is kind of cool. You can read like their unpublished works that they're trying to get published and um, just suss out like, oh, I like the way that they did it. So I'm going to do it this way. And just as you read more plays, you'll get a, a feel for what you like and um, uh, what works for you. Um, regarding that and um, I want to move on from format um, should I continue this or do something new um I'll check that out like in the last 30 minutes if that's okay so just hang on to that link so that you can um, resend it once I get back there um, and I am just so anxious to click out of this garbage because um, now we're gonna get into the actual act of writing. So I just want to say for this first class that this, what I'm about to explain, is what I'm going to be continuing to explain for the next five classes. So it is a-okay if you do not get this at first. I, I will spend the next five classes <laughs> explaining further how to do it. Um, so uh, you'll find in the next Hour so that I make uh, or uh, 30 minutes whoo you'll you'll find um, that this is where gardening is going to come in so if you're the kind of person that's used to being an architect again it might take you a second to get used to this because if you've taken Connor's classes this is it's a, like a total reversal it's it might be a bit confusing at first but that's okay if you're a gardener you might be like yeah this is great. Um, so, again, I just sort of reiterate that I, like, don't even think of premises for my scripts until I've developed my characters and until I've developed in my head sort of a, a voice for them. Um, so, uh, for... Architects, I feel like, are the kind of person that has log lines. They have ideas for movies in the barrel. The, you know, you can be like, hey, you got any movies, movie ideas? And they'll be like, I've got an idea. It's Carrie meets iCarly. And it's about a magical YouTuber whose mom is a crazy person. See, you can already tell I'm not the kind of person that has ideas in the barrel. <laughs> um, what I do have in the barrel are, like, fun characters that I enjoy thinking about in my head. Um, uh, I have an idea. It, they're, they're a bit harder to explain, um, which is just the fact of being a gardener. So if you're the kind of person that's like, I don't really have an idea for a movie, but I have an idea for like a fun character that I like often think about in my head, this might be right for you. And it, through, it is through the act of writing that I then figure out the premise because I figure out what my characters would organically be doing. And yeah, this is, <laughs> this is just kind of a reiteration of that. My sources of inspiration often come from my real life. I'll have a conversation with someone and come out of that, you know, as a person, I, I have social anxiety. So I often come out of interactions being like, well, that could have gone better. How could that have gone better? And then I, I drive home and I fantasize about what I could have said or how that how that conversation could have gone. If you're the kind of person who has like arguments with invisible people in the shower, then this kind of writing might be for you. If you have arguments um, in your car, this kind of writing might be for you. Um, 
Or if you're the kind of person who watches TV shows and you become frustrated because you're like, why did those characters talk like that? Or that I feel like that conversation could have gone a little bit better. Or I wish this character had said this. Then this might be for you because in this approach to writing, you're going to be taking those ideas, taking those things that you're imagining and putting them on paper and then developing stories based on those. Um, if you're the kind of person, you're like a, a hopeless romantic and you, you fantasize about your crush and interactions you could be having with your crush, then this might be for you because you want to take those fantasies that you have and expand them into entire plays, entire one acts by the end of this six week class. As it is a Morgan, can you yes. can you either zoom in uh, or full screen this or read it out loud? I'm just, we're just having a little trouble oh, reading it. Yeah, let's full screen that and I'll just read it out loud as well. Rather than a whole premise, we'll begin with ideas for amusing interactions. Sources of inspiration can be real life conversations, fantasies, fan fiction versions of TV shows. Um, uh, be thinking of these as I go over examples. Um, does anyone have one right now um if not it's totally okay because it's hard to just think of those um does anybody have um maybe an example of like something you want to say to your boss or something you you're kicking yourself because it's a you came up with a really good comeback after after you had an argument like oh i should have said this feel free to submit it to the chat or um just say it out loud um, oh, I was going to say this earlier, but for some reason, participating in class becomes so much more nerve wracking when it's virtual. I have like no problem participating in, in like real life classes, but I become so terrified of participating in um, virtual class. So it's okay if you're nervous, but do feel free to chime in. <laughs> so much... The last episode of Lost. I haven't seen it. I watched the first season, but... Um, <laughs> somebody's saying they Google clever insults on Reddit. Do you describe their character traits first, then describe an appropriate setting around them? Um, we'll totally get into that in just a second. Um, I kind of do it simultaneously but for our purposes we'll we'll put the interaction in a setting and then we'll and then we will be figuring out character traits but you'll get a feel for it as we begin it is sort of simultaneous um cool 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 um great um boop, boop, boop. Um, let me, um, I'll go ahead and full screen this as we continue. When I full screen, I can't check the chat as easily. So if you have a burning question, do not hesitate to chime in. You're not interrupting me. It's very welcome for you to be participating in class. Um, but yeah, be thinking of examples of these because um, in a second, I'm going to be asking you to, um, I'm going to have us do an example of my writing approach um, as a class with this example. Um, okay, I actually do so kind just of... To, just to narrow it down, sorry, Mark, just to narrow it down and like into one quick thing for people to be thinking of, you, you're thinking along the lines of something that you wanted to say to someone or like some interaction that you've like wanted to have or have thought about before that isn't real? Yeah, or maybe it was real. Maybe you did have a conversation that was real and you thought the conversation was hilarious and you want to put it in a play. Um, okay. I had a friend who uh, couldn't stop saying, you know what I mean? <laughs> he was like, um, I'll just real quick. I had a friend who, after, there was just one day, I, I don't know why he was doing this. <laughs> I hope he doesn't end up watching this. Oh, by the way, this is recorded. So don't say, don't use an example of something you wouldn't want anybody to have on YouTube. Like, uh, if you wouldn't want it seen on YouTube, don't maybe don't say it in the class. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I had a friend one day who he just couldn't stop saying, you know what I mean? After every single sentence, he was, he was just like, um, yeah, and that, and that, uh, yeah, and I got in my car, you know what I mean? And I said to the passenger, you know what I mean? I said, 
uh, uh, why are you yelling at me? You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just like, yeah, we know what you mean, dude. Um, so that gave me the idea that I want to write a character that says that, who is explaining something that is very easy to understand, um, but he is constantly compelled to say, you know what I mean, because that's hilarious to me. Maybe it's not funny to you. I think that's hilarious. Um, great. So I'm actually going to have us go ahead and watch this YouTube video because I think it'll really help sort of explain how my improv approach filters into this. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to paste this in the chat. Oops. Uno momento. There's this great quote about improv of, you, you, and I'm, I'm sure this is the first thing anyone latches onto, but I latched onto it, which is, uh, First, you you get you get up in the air and then you build the plane. Right, exactly. Or the other the other the other at the other. So we're not getting audio for it, Morgan. Maybe if you just off. paste oh, really? the link into the, the chat, we can uh, watch it like that. Yeah, let's yeah, do that. That's I think it's because you didn't set up like an audio input through o OBS or something like that. Uh, but we can yeah, just like right. just how long is it? Three minutes? Yeah, just give yeah, people three, three minutes, minutes or something. Yeah, here I'm gonna paste this in the chat. Go ahead and watch this. It's it, it'll say. Uh, it's like hashtag free playwriting class. Um, so go to that chat. It should be like right above where it says general chat. And um, just click that. It's three minutes long. I'll have us come back at 3.14. Um, and then if you don't finish it, just, you know, just go ahead and watch it after. But um, maybe I can set it up in OBS really quick. chat yeah so if you go to um where it says hashtag free uh free playwriting class um it'll be right there do you see it so it's going to be on the left hand side of your discord window if you're on uh desktop um under the folder called discussion scroll all the way to the bottom i know there's like and a above million tabs um you can minimize the, uh, the folders by clicking next to them. Um, if it doesn't work, I can also just like explain what he says and then um, keep it there for you guys to watch later. I think it's working fine. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Um, for anybody who's watching the YouTube video after the fact, um, it's, um, <laughs> it's a video, um, I mean, you can see here, um, it's Keegan-Michael Key talking about improv, um, and basically what he's saying is that, uh, full webcam, hello, um, basically what he's saying is that doing improv is it's like jumping out of the plane and figuring out how you're going to land later um so you're starting and then you're figuring out how to continue and how to end um and that's largely what my writing style is based on i start with an interaction and then i figure out from there how the characters are going to respond to that situation and how and and what the payoff is going to be based on everything that has happened so far and i'm not doing this justice keegan michael key explains it really well um so in the youtube video we post i um will hopefully be able to post like a link in the description that you can just click on while you're watching this we can splice it into the recording too, don't we? That's great. Love to hear it. Also, do you guys like my stuffed animals? Enjoy. Connor has a cool green screen. 
but I don't have that. I don't have a fancy green screen. So you guys have to learn about my personality through my bedroom. Good character development that way. Yeah. Very Showing good. instead of telling. Yeah. My grandma knitted this blanket. Um, that's my guitar. Guitar is my quarantine hobby. Oh my god, I'm blurry. Okay, I'm back. We'll get started in just uno momento. My bedroom's a mess too, just to be <laughs> fair. Are you saying my bedroom's a mess? No! I'm, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Just me laughing at my own jokes. Okay, yeah, we'll get started again uh, now. You're, you're doing really well. <laughs> Thanks, you're so nice. Thank you for um, chiming in, like unmuting and chiming in. It's very helpful. Um, does anybody have any comments about that video, those who were able to watch it? Um, I guess like the first two thirds were like, or I actually like I'm, I'm in the middle of taking an um, introductory improv class. Okay. So, like the first two thirds like resonated, and the mm -hmm. last third like I get as example at all, but uh, I suck at basketball, so <laughs> it made it like sound harder. Like I, I think he was like I think most people played basketball and like are a little less familiar with improv. Yeah, so, I like, that, that example would be like oh look at this thing that's like, you know, way more familiar. It's like this thing, but for me it was like. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. But I know I, that it's not actually like that. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. I, I don't know. I, it's, like, embarrassing how little I know about sports. But he uses enough other examples that I think it, like, at that point, it kind of resonates with me at least a little bit. Um, but I, I'm glad at least those first two-thirds resonated with you. Um, cool. So now we're going to get into an example of like what the heck I'm talking about. Um, go full screen. There we go. <laughs> it's taking a sec. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So this is my writing process. I start with an interaction which is just a movie that you see in your head, in your imagination, that you think is, am is amusing or resonates with you in some way. I mostly write comedies. That being said, I'm challenging myself as of late. I'm writing just a straight up depressing ass horror. Um, horror, not horror. <laughs> um, Would you mind making this full screen, Morgan, please? Oh, yes. That's Thank you. what I was meaning to do. Yeah, uh, it'll be full screen for the next bit. Um, so, yeah, if you're the kind of person who prefers drama, it could just be like a movie in your head that makes you feel something. Um, something that somebody said that you want to explore. Um, and you want to think about things like what is the mood of the characters in this scene that is playing in your head? You might have to negotiate the interaction to be suitable for the stage or if you're writing a movie or a TV show you might have to negotiate that interaction to be suitable for the camera um, for example uh, when me and Connor were discussing this um, beforehand he was talking about um, an interaction he'd had with somebody online um, and so we negotiated that interaction to be in person rather than online. And we made a situation that suited the circumstances in person. That way it works better for um, writing wise. Maybe you want to do a Zoom thing. I don't know. I feel like more Zoom. There's a, okay, this is a complete tangent. I'm sorry. I've seen a lot of plays lately that are created specifically for Zoom. Like, the the actors are, like, on a Zoom call or something. So if that's something that interests you, Google, like, virtual theater festival. And you'll probably find some, some theaters that are looking for something like that. Okay, so I start with an interaction. A movie in my head that I find is compelling. Then I get into the character traits and the relationship dynamics that filter into that interaction. So, um... 
For example, um, let's say um, a guy named Harold is talking to another guy named Bob about um, the sports game that just came on. And he's, you know, going back to like what that guy was talking about. He's pretending to be more into sports than he is. And he, he's, he's, he's talking about the sports game and trying his darndest to act like he knows about sports when he clearly doesn't know about sports. We're thinking about the character traits and relationship dynamics that filter into that situation. What character traits can you assume about each person? The guy who's pretending about to know about sports, clearly he's trying to impress that other person. Clearly he's nervous. Clearly he's the kind of guy that normally doesn't know anything about sports. So, um, <laughs> not to say, I, I, um, I, I don't want, um, uh, the guy that was saying earlier that he doesn't know about basketball, P please don't think that this is about you at all. I also don't know anything about sports, but maybe he's a guy who's more into theater. Maybe he's a bit more wimpy. M you know, these are just all things you can think about. What character traits can you assume about the person based on the interaction that they are happening in the movie in your head? What is the power dynamic between the characters in the interaction. Does one character have power over the other? Is one of them an authority? Um, it does. It, I, by power dynamic, I don't necessarily mean that one character is the boss and the other one's the employee, or one character is the parent and the other one's a child. You know, expressly stated power dynamics. I mean, does one character have a crush on the other character? That would put the characters in an imbalance of of power because if one person has a crush on the other person they're going to be trying to impress that person they're going to be simping that person which gives the other person a little bit of power um does that um yeah cool um do you want to volunteer or, or do you want someone to work with while you do this or do you want um, to just... i'm just going to Go explain ahead. this all and then in the next okay. one i'm going to explain with an example and then after that we're going to do an example with somebody in the class um, Sounds good. I'm just putting this all out there. I'm not expecting you, you guys to understand this quite yet because it's so new and it's so different from what Connor does. Um, okay, so the next thing you want to think about is the history between the characters. Has this interaction happened before in the past? Um, that is the most it is a very fun thing to play with if if the if um you know terry what's his name harold if harold is desperately trying to impress this guy what other times in the past has he tried to impress this guy last week did he embarrass himself pretending to know about sports these are all things you can think about that are going to make your characters really fun to develop through that interaction the next thing you want to develop is the plot slash premise. Plot premise is a really big word for what I'm talking about. It's a... I almost don't like that I'm using the phrase plot premise. Really, what I, the phrase that I want to use is payoff. The payoff to that interaction. The big why. Potential directions that the scene could go that actively integrate and challenge the power dynamic, the relationship dynamics, and the character traits that you've established through processing and developing that interaction. Again, um, I just want to say um, it is a-okay if this is a bit confusing right now. I'm going to explain it more, and again, I'm going to explain it over the next five weeks. I'll probably take the last, like, 20 minutes to be going over like your guys' ideas and stuff just because I didn't get um I wanna I wanna just rumble through this. Okay, let me switch the OBS really quick to be browser only again. Okay, so here's my example that I used. Oh my lord. Okay. This is an example from my real life 
I fucking hate it when people chew with their mouth open. I can't stand it. I think it's the worst thing on the planet. I'm pretty sure I have something called misophonia. It's like the psychological term for it. And it's it drives me insane. So the movie that plays in my head <laughs> is that I'm screaming at somebody for chewing with their mouth open. So I might say something like, so the we're going to negotiate that interaction where I'm screaming at somebody to be a situation where a character is screaming at somebody. We'll say her name is Margaret. She's screaming at a guy named Joe because he's chewing with his mouth open and they're on a date. So let's think about the character traits and relationship dynamics that could filter into a situation where a woman is yelling at a man on a date at a restaurant that you have fundamentally no self-awareness. That is what she's yelling at him. You fundamentally lack self-awareness and he uh, looks offended. There's a lot of directions we could go with this. Um, a character trait I would assume about Margaret is that she is a bitch. I would assume that she um, is very stuck up. I would assume that she has a temper. I would assume um, to get even more specific, we, which we can totally do, maybe she's like a businesswoman who is blunt and tells it like it is, but subsequently has no filter sometimes and says things that offend people. Um, and we can use that. We can leave behind what traits we want to leave behind. We can use what we want to use. Um, what about the guy? Maybe he's a slob. Maybe he's the, maybe he doesn't have self-awareness and she's totally right. He kind of is, is the kind of guy who lacks self-awareness. Maybe he's pretty, um, slobbery in general he's not the most put together kind of guy maybe he's kind of awkward and bumbling and he struggles to keep himself put together and composed um or <laughs> uh this is sort of the ideas phase of of it you're just throwing what you can against the wall seeing what sticks having so much fun diving into these characters and thinking about what works and what doesn't work Maybe he's like a truck driver kind of dude. <laughs> he's like, um, not to, you know, I mean, I to stereotype a little bit. Um, he is a truck driver kind of guy. He doesn't care if he gets food on his clothes and he doesn't care if he's chewing with his mouth open. Um, he doesn't care about being composed and she does. Um, relationship dynamics. Let's dive into that. Um, we want them to know each other already um, because that makes it easier. Um, we'll just say that for this first class, at least we always want the characters to know each other beforehand. We don't want them to just be meeting um, because we want them to have a history together. Um, maybe they're in the thinking about breaking up phase um, and things escalate into an awkward public fight. This is an interaction they've had before. Maybe at home, this is a thing that she's constantly yelling at him about. She's, it's, a, it's a fight they have constantly. Um, she's always saying, you know, Joe, I need you to, I, I like you, but if you can't learn to chew with your mouth open, with your mouth closed, then things aren't going to work out. Um, and then maybe things escalate into a really awkward public fight. And that challenges both of their character dynamics because um, maybe she's trying to work on her temper. Her temper is something that she really struggles with. And she doesn't like the fact that she's always yelling at people in public. And she's been trying really hard not to. But nonetheless, she finds herself in this situation again. She's yelling at somebody in public. Maybe it challenges his uh, character traits because uh, going back to maybe he's the kind of awkward bumbling guy who really struggles to stand up for himself and here he is 
getting yelled at in public and it's really embarrassing for himself and he wants to learn how to stand up for himself but he can't and um i'll just pop it back on myself really quick um to describe um another direction this could have gone um we could have gone in the direction of these are actually two really nice people and they both have huge crushes on each other and they're on a date and they're, it's really working out they've they've been on like a couple of dates they went to a park one day and the other day um ah, i don't know they went ice skating for the other day um the other date but this is their first dinner date and she likes everything about this guy but the funny thing is this is the first time she's seeing him eat and to her horror he chews with his mouth open and she likes everything about this guy except the fact that he chews with his mouth open so that's uh the payoff of that would really challenge their relationship dynamic because let's say you have a huge crush on this guy but if he chews with his mouth open and it drives you ballistic in your head and you're trying to constantly hide the fact that you're going crazy then it's going to be kind of a hilarious compelling struggle to watch throughout the date while she's trying to figure out how to cover the fact that she's going crazy in her head i don't know i think that's funny um great i'm just going to check this stream chat to see if um there's any questions or comments about that? Um, maybe there's a follow-up scene. The guys... Um, oh, yeah, that would be funny. Like, Because in um, certain cultures, it's more welcome to do slurping. So if she is... Um, like, if she sh she's <laughs> really struggling with um, the... Uh, sounds of slurping she goes to his place and his whole family is slurping she would just go crazy right so that would be actually a really fun payoff like and if this play were to continue after after the interaction of their restaurant date and she go, ends up going to his place and meeting his family that would be hilarious you're playing with her character traits um okay great does anybody have any questions before we move on to another example Bear in mind, this is just opening you guys up to the the, the concept of the way that I approach this. Um, so it's okay if you're like, I don't really get it yet, because we'll go we'll go over it again next class as well. Um, just give you guys a couple of seconds if there's any questions. I just want to chime in and say, so Script yeah. Camp comes with two-week free trial with our unlimited um, subscription. So uh, this is a six-week course. If you sign up now and you are not already a member, you can get two, cl two additional classes as well as all of our other labs and workshops like today's Writer's Lab, which starts at 4 o'clock. It's kind of like office hours where you can come in with any problems that you have with any script that you're working on or questions that you have or topics you want to hear more about. That starts right after this. So we have lots of great stuff to sign up for at scriptcamp.net slash membership. There should be some slides about that towards the end. Yeah, I did. I put slides about that uh, towards the end. Um, thank you so much, Connor. Um, sure. Thank you to everyone who's participating in the chat. I like super duper appreciate it. Um, let's see. Um, so I want to ask um, before I move on to the next slide. Um, does anybody have an example of like an interaction you want to use? uh for an exercise and we'll we'll kind of do it as a class um um i see you posted a link is that uh let's see 53 star lord there are plenty here um i don't know if i can go into your document do, could could you potentially type one, copy and paste one into the chat or um, go ahead and unmute and, and chat about it? I think Morgan's just asking for a, a single yeah, idea for like an interaction, right? Not a whole play. Interaction. Um, like maybe your friend said something the other day you thought was funny that you want to explore. It, it's not that deep. Um, and we'll, even if it's something... Yeah. Yeah, I've, go for I've, it. I've got, some, I've, I've got something 
that's kind of interesting in my Hobbit musical, which okay. is like the, the big moment when you meet Thorin Oakenshield for the first time. Okay, I might struggle with it, this one because I I haven't seen the Hobbit, but um, please continue. Yeah, it's, it's okay. You don't you don't have to have seen the movies. The movies are crap. That's why I made this musical was because the movies were crap. But anyway, love it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway, so basically. In the musical, Thorne Oakenfield, who's, like, really old and definitely mm-hmm. not played by Richard West's name. Okay. He's, he's old, he's rude, he is condescending, and he's in the house of this humble hobbit, who's also kind of aristocratic, but not quite... Yeah, he's... He, he, but they all view him as inferior, because he's powder. not a dwarf, and... Yeah. Right. He's like he's like a, he's like a redneck he's like a redneck but he's he's like a middle class so and he's got these burgling mm-hmm. skills maybe so mm-hmm. who knows so there's this whole section in the script where he, he's like where 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 Thorin is saying something and then he's signing mm-hmm. because dwarves have a secret sign language this is part of Tolkien canon. Mm-hmm. And he's signing something completely different, and th- and that is marked up in the script. And yeah, I, I'm trying, I'm trying to get past the Gandalf, Gandalf, good gracious me, which is another great moment between two characters. Yeah. So, um, so it's Thorin and and who, who's the other guy? Sorry. Thorin and Bilbo and some oh, other sorry. characters are there as well. But yeah, and they're um, like, let's... I, I'm gonna re- I'm gonna see if I can read the bit where. All these dwarves, like nine of them, have showed up already. Mm-hmm. Supper for ten. All, and then he sings a song called "Supper for Ten. How dare you all bang on my beautiful dream? Yeah, I'm gonna cut you off for just a second. Um, so because this is such an expansive story, I wanna negotiate this interaction just down to its like at the barest, teeniest moment. So could you pick like one thing? That either Thorin says or that Bilbo says that we can work off of, and we'll negotiate it. Um, I, I, it's, it, what, the things that Thorin says, says are more interesting because Thorin mm-hmm. says, "Is this it then?" Okay, he says, "Is this it to, to Bilbo?" He says it to Bilbo, but what he's signing to the other dwarves is, "My God, this something like something like something like what." What? 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 Slovenly person built this place? Okay. Because it's slovenly it. by dwarven standards, but it's beautiful by our standards. But yeah. Okay, I got it. So I'm gonna negotiate that this because for the purposes of uh my class, um, just and specifically this class. I'm going to keep everything really grounded to things that like could happen in real life. So I'm going to negotiate this example just a little bit. Um, not, and not by a little this. bit, I mean actually uh, quite a bit. Oh, missed that. Side, There's but. a spit where he's talking with one of the other dwarves. Mm-hmm. He says, that will suffice. Bilbo says, I'm truly sorry, but that will suffice. And then he says, secretly, we're leaving now. One of the other dwarves says, no, this is wrong, and you know it secretly. And Bombor rapid fire signs, we haven't even eaten yet. And then Galandalf rapid fire signs in a different English Mac. Settle down, you fools, he's watching us all. Okay, so I'm going to negotiate this. So um, just just because the, the Hobbit... Um, yeah, it's kind of complicated. It, yeah, it's yeah very, this isn't this is an exercise here. Yeah, we're just, yeah. So just for the purposes of the exercise, we're not trying to adapt a scene. So we're not trying to like convey a story that has already existed and like communicate it. For Morgan's exercise, I think she's looking for it. Correct me if I'm wrong, Morgan. Just the very basics of an interaction. So this would be yeah. a house guest has showed up and they're exactly. communicating something different in sign language than they're saying to you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually going to negotiate that even more and, and dwindle it down to even oh bare bones. So I'm going to say a house guest. Um, instead of, uh, I'm going to say his name is Soren because that's like a more Soren. like grounded yeah. name. Or actually, no, that would be Bilbo, right? So his name will be Bob. Bob so, and Soren. Yeah, a house guest 
has someone over. Oh no, house guest. That's sorry. Yeah, uh, I mean, right. I mean, there's, um, I mean, there's Mr. G, who's like their. I don't know. How, this is getting really weird. Yeah, no worries. Um, a house guest, Soren, remarks to the host, who is Bob. He he doesn't actually remark it. Is this it? He, he, is this it then? Is this it? Is this it then? That's what I'm. That's what I'm going to negotiate the interaction. Barest, barest bones. A house guest, and you can forget all that like fantastical imagery just for this exercise. Don't worry. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's, it's um, just easier for everyone this way. Yeah, yeah. I want to. I want to motor through this just a little bit so we have time to go over people's um ideas. And they're, and they're like, and they're they're like, yeah. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, well, I just, um, yeah. So a house guest remarks to a host, let's say they're at a dinner party. Is this it then? What can we assume about a house guest that is going, that is saying that to a host? What can we assume? Um, feel free to uh, chime in, guys. Um, um, it's kind of like them saying, uh, they were expecting this great big thing, and then it's like the reveal is a big letdown. So yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so that that that's a great idea. So their expectations were set up high. So an idea, maybe Bob, um, was kind of a skeevy liar, and he said, um, he like made Soren have all these expectations. That's interesting. Um, that's an idea, um, gave Soren tons of expectations. Um, please ignore my spelling mistakes and stuff. Um, I was thinking, um, maybe Soren, um, is another idea, another direction we can go to is maybe Soren is kind of pompous. And he's the kind of guy, yeah, that's like... Maybe he is pompous. Yeah, like, outside of Bob's prompting, he had Bob, expectations yeah. of grandeur. He wanted this dinner party to be amazing. Um, he wanted this dinner party to be something like out of the Great Gatsby or something. Yeah, exactly. That is just a COVID dinner party. Maybe he thought... He he thought Bob was rich like he is. Um, and maybe he's rich. Oh um, yeah. These are just ideas. They can totally contradict each other. Um, uh, but we also they have really the idea don't. that yeah. he was misled by Bob. Um, does anybody have ideas? Um, I'm gonna pop into uh, the chat so I can see um, if anybody's posting ideas there. Um, Bob promised there would be fondue. Ooh yes. Maybe Soren is hard to impress. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, yeah, Gandalf or somebody would have to promise to Soren fondue. Mm -hmm. Cal Frodo, I really like your idea where it's so pretty much someone just saying something really nice to somebody's face, then passing a note to their friends to make fun of them. I really like that. If we, if we, uh, if we didn't dwindle the conversation down to such bare bones, I would totally have used that. Um, but I just want it like to be like that single line, you know, where just some guy is disappointed. I don't want there to be like more characters just because it gets complicated. What, you don't make your yeah. ice clear weak sauce, bro? I have a friend who's really into making clear ice. I don't, I don't get it. Um, cool, yeah, so I just want to motor through this um, because uh, we're running motor short through. on time. Um, so, what's some payoffs we could get? Actually, before the payoffs... Oh, ignore that. Um, before we get into the payoffs, what is their relationship? What is their power dynamic? Are they friends? Are they co-workers? Um, somebody put something in the chat. I don't want to I don't want to choose. Are they old friends? Have they had this conversation before? Is Bob constantly trying to impress Soren and just failing at it? Boss and intern. Okay, who's the boss? I feel like it could be fun. Which one should be the boss? Which one should be the intern? What do you think? I feel like it's, it could be fun. 
Intern is hard to, is the hard to impress on. Okay, nice, Connor. Um, yeah, we'll stick with uh, the intern is the hard to impress on. Okay, so we'll say um, Soren is Bob's intern. <laughs> okay, Soren is Bob's intern. Um, Soren is hard to impress. Bob is trying to impress him. Trying to impress him. So we can imagine, you know, at work, maybe Bob has been trying so hard to impress the new intern because he thinks the new intern is just so cool. And he uh, invited the new intern over to his house because he wants to impress him with this dinner. And then the new intern shows up and... He's unimpressed. He thinks his house is shabby. He thinks, um, and I'm filling in a lot of the gaps here just for time's sake. Normally, I would, I would let you guys do a little bit more of this. He thinks the dinner's shabby. He thinks the house is ugly. And it's funny, right, because normally an intern would be trying to impress a boss. So we've got a little bit of a fun subversion there. What are some, some fun uh, ways that this could pay off? Um... What, how what how could this end? Like, what's a fun way that this could end? Um, I have ideas. Um, Soren has a bad first impression, but takes a bite of the fondue. Oh shit! He has an Anton ego moment. I don't know what that means, um, but I assume some other people do. He immediately takes another bite. Oh, okay. So it could end up flipped on his on its head. Um, maybe the house is shabby. The dinner looks gross, but then in the end. Turns out Soren's a really good cook or something. Um, I want to end it in a way that more so integrates their character relationship and dynamics. Um, okay, okay, okay. The boss is continuously trying to impress the intern by proving that he's young and cool too. And he's like trying to use all these cool like young slang words. Like he's like, hey, yellow, FOMO, haha. That's hilarious. I love that. Um, the boss realizes he's the boss and thus fires the intern. That's actually perfect. Okay, great. Because that integrates both the, the strange sort of subverted power dynamic there as well as the character traits. So, Soren, the character traits that we're engaging is that Soren is hard to impress and that the boss is trying to impress Soren. Um, and that therefore he's probably like kind of inconfident and kind of... Uh, you know, he struggles with the fact that he's kind of older. Um, so we're engaging with those traits and we're engaging with those character dynamics by having the payoff be that the boss finally works up, works up some confidence and is like, fine, you don't like my dinner party, you're fired because he can do that. And that's the payoff. That's the end of the scene is he gets fired, which the subsequent unfolding of that those events that's i'm blurry come back come back face oh well i can be blurry the subsequent unfolding of that could be the rest of your show you know a boss is gonna get in trouble if he fires his intern for not liking his dinner party that's awesome i love that okay i don't remember who posted it but anyway I'm getting like so, so many good ideas in the chat. Um, the intern hating the job exhales and goes finally and leaves the scene. That could be interesting because the intern is like, why would I work with somebody who has no confidence? I like that. Okay. I'm going to make myself full webcam. I'm trying to figure out why I'm blurry. Oh, well. I guess it's okay. So sometimes if you change depth, like you get close to the camera, then far away, it has to refocus, but it should fix itself soon. Oh, fixed. Cool. <laughs> okay. And you guys get to see my pores, so that's good. Um, okay, you guys did a really, really good job with that. Like, so many good ideas in the in the stream chat. I'm just going to make it big um, because love it. This is fun. Okay, cool. Great job, guys. Um, so I'm just going to really, really quickly... Um, uh, just go over the, like, script camp stuff, and then we'll use the last, like, five, ten minutes to go over, like, people's ideas to the class and, like, um, stuff like we can, that. If, we can go over a little bit. I mean, if you are okay with it more, you can end it whenever you want, but, like, just there's not a hard rule that says it has to end right at the 
at the yeah. last minute of the class. Just how right about now. we do? Um, how about like we'll be like whoever wants. We'll we'll end with ideas, and then like if people want to stay longer, they totally can. But like also totally no worries if not. I mean, it, it, it's always involuntary to be here, but uh, well, uh, I guess what I'm saying is I'm totally willing to go over and chat about ideas for those that want to. Um, so we also have lab right after this, so if you have an idea and you want to get more feedback on it, just hop over in the lab. Cool load. Okay, so I was going to have you guys do, like, a monologuing exercise, but I don't think we really have time. Um, but feel free to, like, take a screenshot of this or whatever. Um, it might not we make share, sense. We'll share a link to the um, presentation after. Okay, great. Yeah, feel free to do this in your own time. Um, that's just me reiterating that it's okay if you don't get it. Let's discuss your ideas. We'll do that in a sec. I would just want, um, for Connor and, and Nacho, I, I just really want to make sure that we hit these these points. Um, Connor, did you want me, uh, did you want to talk about this, or do you want me to talk about it? I can do a rundown if you want. So yeah, we have lab after this. That's available to all unlimited members. That's Saturdays, four to six. Um, we might just start at a couple minutes late today if we run a little over on here. But that is like office hours where you can come and ask questions and hear more about whatever topics you want, and we can go over outlines or um, just get advice on stuff that you've written. Um, table reads Sundays, four o'clock. So that's tomorrow. Um, all our times are in Pacific, so bring up to five pages of a script, and you can have other students read it, and you can get feedback on it. Workshops and classes, Wednesday, Thursday, 4 to 7. TV pilot boot camp, rewrite, and features. Are, those are our sort of main three staples that are always, you know, it resets after the cycle is done. Uh, TV pilot boot camp is Sundays, 11 to 1, so that's tomorrow. Rewrite boot camp, we're in the middle of right now, but in two weeks, the new one will be starting. Saturdays, 12 to 2. And then feature boot camp, which is sort of our bread and butter, takes you from idea to finished draft in eight weeks of a feature film script. That's Fridays, four to six, and um, our uh, we're in the in the course right now in the last couple of weeks of it. So just come back in about two weeks, and a new one will have started. Cool. Pretty and there's good. the membership info. Yep, remember, unlimited membership gets you access to everything we do here, all the different topics, all the classes, all the labs, and um, just yep, it, there's nothing that is left out. So uh, forty nine dollars a month. It comes with a two week free trial, so you can theoretically come to. Many events in that time to decide if you like it. Scriptcamp.net slash membership. How to enroll. Scriptcamp.net slash classes. Slash membership. Cool. Drop by the writer's lab. Did you want to talk more about that? Or are you good? I hear about play genres and uh, how to, like, if, if folks want to start, maybe, if, can we maybe look at a few... Not not if they have you may not have log lines for your shows, but just like whatever people have to share. Do you think we could have some time to look at that? Yeah, that could be fun. Cool. Referral and there's program. referral program. Yeah. Refer your friends. They get a discount and you get a free thing. Cool. Now I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna put myself back as well hello and i'm gonna have us oops <laughs> discuss some ideas <laughs> cool um or actually i'll just make it full webcam does anybody have like ideas that they want to discuss um for their plays i know um this class um it's i'm prefer Referring things to be very grounded, feel free to give ideas for, like, either just interactions that you maybe want to explore, maybe you got inspired during class at some point, or feel free if you have, like, ideas that you came in with for playwriting that, that you want to, um, like, discuss. Like, just anything is on the table, is I guess what I'm saying. Yes. So, and I'll put up the stream. Um, Go ahead, Aaron. First of all, yeah, hey. Uh, Hi. First of all, I wanted to say this was a really awesome class. You know, Thank it was you. really, yeah. I mean, because it's like this is pretty much the way I write, but I never had the right way to put it into words. Yes. And That's what I like. you know, yeah, it was like, well, wow, this is you're pretty much describing my entire my entire process. So it's That's, like, oh my god, that makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, anyway, for getting down to brass tacks, I had, like, somewhere way back in the, in the chat, I posted a link to, like, something that says Gary Vaynerchuk is demented. Oh, 
right? So there, there is a guy um, who's like big on TikTok and like other places, and he gives like motivation. He's like a motivational speaker mm-hmm. about like how to get rich quick. One of those kinds of guys. And then there's a vi- there's these two guys who are watching a video of him, and Gary V. Gary Gary Vaynerchuk says, "Hey." You know, you know, like, what do you think, uh, what's most, he's like talking to this woman who asked him a question, like, what's most important to you, right? Mm-hmm. And then she's like, well, my family. And then he says, now picture one of your family members getting shot in the face, Jesus right? Christ. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I do that every morning when I'm in the shower for 10 minutes a day, and that's the key to my happiness. So what if you didn't have that success? It's all about perspective. So <laughs> those two guys are watching that. <laughs> And then they're just kind of like, man, you know, like, there's the easy way to say that, but then Gary Vee wanted that, wanted that viral moment, right? So he goes, and then they just come up with, picture your grandmother getting run over by a bus, you know, picture, like, uh, you know, 10,000 locusts coming down and eating your house. It's like, increasingly ridiculous situations. Yeah. And I love that, like, little bit of interaction between these two guys talking, like, ripping on Gary V, demented Gary V. Yeah. Um, is this yeah. really a movie? It is, it is, for a short. And it's like, it's, mm-hmm. I'm pretty much poaching this interaction for that short. It's like, mm-hmm. I'm kind of, play- it's in a different context, but I'm playing off of um, that same idea, where it's just like, sometimes your subconscious will make things out to be a lot worse than it really is. So maybe mm-hmm. you had a thought. Mm-hmm. Of doing something but you didn't actually act on it and then you just come up with like more and more ridiculous ways of like putting yourself down for even considering doing something yeah it's really fun to write that way because it, it's like uh it's like a fake imaginary your fake imaginary version of life that you wish was yeah. real <laughs> or that you think <laughs> is funny or that makes you feel emotions um yeah, I super like that idea. I with the all the online stuff, I think it could be tricky for a play, but as a movie, that sounds fantastic. That sounds so darkly comedic. Um, love that. Um, did you need? Um, do you want any insights on it or anything like that, or um, did you just want to like share your idea? Yeah, I mean, real. It's like a guy mm-hmm. um, pretty much like wakes up in a hotel after like a one night stand. Doesn't remember how he got there. This, it's like there's some context to this, but like he just mm-hmm. he doesn't have a lot of money, and then he notices like stack of money sticking out of her purse, and then like the th- also by the way, this is a story where like um, people's reflections can talk to them, so it's like oh, cool. a reflection of his subconscious. So then he mm-hmm. sees like this big mirror on the other side of the room and then like the moment the thought crosses his mind to like steal the money it's like his subconscious whispering in his ear hey you know it's like she won't notice maybe uh, 40 bucks missing right you got to make your rent and then like for a minute he considers it and then he stops himself and then his subconscious just comes up with like how like what the fuck is wrong with you like why would you even think to do that and then starts coming up with more like increasingly uh you know increasingly intense ways of like how that could have gone wrong for her and like berating him and then he can't help but laugh right yeah that's great so you have like the interesting because you can get into like what are the character traits of his like reflection (laughs) and then kind of go from there and like dig into that yeah and, like, what is the power dynamic between him and his reflection? Does he have the power? Does the reflection have the power? I imagine it would probably, like, switch. Um, yeah, that's neat. I like that a lot. Um, uh, cool. We'll talk about Connor has one post in the chat. I don't have a story here yet. That's always perfect. Like, for, for like, specifically my style of writing is when you're, like, I don't have a story or a plot for this, but I think it would be funny if these two characters did this. Um, I don't have a story here yet, but... The character of a court jester is really interesting to me. An insomniac jester becomes acquainted with the knight staff of a castle. Okay. Discovering some kind of mystery that they need to work together to solve. Interesting. So it's like, what is... So like, I'm imagining like a jester talking to like the knight staff. Um, Connor, like, what um, specific knight staff would it be like? I don't know, like, who would work in a castle, but, like, the janitor or, like, the chef? Yeah, exactly. So all okay. kinds of people would need, be needed to keep a castle running 
through the 24 hour, through the graveyard shift, right? With the guards, you have the person that goes and empties all the chamber pots. You have like the unseen people of the medieval world who all kind of come and meet meet each other and they have like full reign of the place at night. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so there's almost like, there there is definitely like a, a wider story there. Um, I'm compelled to think of like... Um, so you picture this as a as a play? Sure, I, I just was throwing because I, I this might be a book, this might be a play. This is just a character mm-hmm. and like a vague setup. So I thought, is this like the kind of level of setup that you're looking for that you think would be good for students to have at this point, or do you want them to have just a character or like or, oh. or, how much do you think they need? Probably for the purposes of like how I'm going to teach, probably the best thing to start with is going to be like I said like those interactions where you have like an idea for an interaction you can have more than that totally you know the good thing about this not being improv is that you're totally able to come up with as much as you want beforehand but specifically I want you to have in your head like a, a movie that amuses you or make, makes you have feeling so um like what's a specific interaction that occurs between the court jester and another person um um, I, so yeah, I don't have that much yet because this is all. I don't. I don't ever come up with interactions first, so I couldn't. Yeah, tell you. so that's that. It's definitely going to be very tricky for architects, um, but that's okay. Like being an architect is is like so valid. Um, it's like, uh, but I would have a very so like, difficult you don't time think this is teaching architecture. Okay, so you're saying this is not the kind of idea that students should be picking, um, or like this is not the level of preparation that they should have for. This idea that they want to be doing in this camp. Um, I'm not saying you can't come in come in with an idea like that. Um, may, maybe your idea, may, maybe you have an idea for like a plot or a premise. Um, so my mine is going to be basically what my class would then help you do is flesh out the characters within those premises. Um, okay. So I would be like, okay, well, like, what's something. Uh, what are like the life philosophies that the court jester has? What are the um, what are the uh, what is the history between the court jester and the chamber pot cleaner? Like what what are they what do they do they hang out? Like what is their thing? Like I would I would probably take that idea and help you have the characters be more fleshed out within that idea. Um, okay, cool. I'm starting to think maybe this would be a better mystery novel or something like that in that case. But um, mm. so yeah, maybe um, Nacho's got some ideas here. Uh, does this? No, it doesn't stretch. Um, does is Posthuman a person or is that like a bot? That That's Nacho's um, username. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, so I missed I'm a bot. couple, so I'm gonna scroll up. Um, oh yeah, it looks like Marcos has one as well. Um, yeah, I have a story, something that can be converted into a play in Regency England. Ooh, period. I love the period pieces. A homely young woman who's arranged to be married catches the Duke um, having ro- romantic relations with another man and blackmails him into marrying her. Love it. Um, cool, yeah, so this kind of goes hand in hand with like what Connor uh, had. Like, um, This is a really solid log line. I actually... Like, like you're better at log lines than I am. Like, I, I am, like, trying to get good at log lines because um, a lot of times with my scripts, um, be- because it'll be so organic, I, j- I don't come up with, like, a log line-esque premise before starting. <laughs> so I have to, like, shove the plot into... Um, a log line after the fact in, in a weird way um so yeah what my class would totally help you with is um figuring out like what uh, the how giving the homely young woman like a voice that compels people um uh what is her relationship um who's arranged to be married catches the duke um so she says we're arranged to be married to the duke right um so like what is their oh what she arranged to be married Wait, um, Marcos, I just have a question. Is she arranged to be married to the Duke? Or is she arranged to be married to somebody else, and then she catches the Duke having romantic relationships with another man, and then blackmails? Um, well, basically how I envisioned it is... Uh, Perfect. Like, 
She specifically married off to solve the whole blood feud issue, and specifically to the family that her family has a blood feud with, is or to squash it. Um, and then the Duke is is her is someone external, but also like let's just, let's just say the guy she's marrying is ugly, and the Duke is hot. <laughs> okay, I I love that. Um, so. This, this might be actually, like I'm realizing now, this might be a really good class for um, people who are like, have t- trouble condensing their ideas into a logline because their I, premises are so backstory, character, and power dynamic based. Like this might be the class for you if you're the kind of person who's like, but a logline can't capture the essence of my work. Um, yeah, so there's a blood feud, right? Um, what compels me, and you might really like the next class because I'm going to talk a lot about, um, like, uh, like histories between characters. Um, like, what is this blood feud? Like, um, how does this, what is the blood feud about? I'm just genuinely curious. Are you? Are you asking me or... Uh, this... Yeah, I'm asking you. What, what is the blood feud about? I'm imagining it's about just, like, territory. One of them claims some land. The other one built a house on it. And they're... And they hate each other for at least 50 years. And then... Well, at least... Probably a little bit more. Because, you know, blood feuds don't really last only 50 years. Right? Is it is it super petty? Or is it, like, legit? It's pretty petty, yeah. Okay. Just like okay. somebody, somebody put dibs on land. Okay, so yeah, and, um, yeah. That that helps me because knowing whether it's a petty feud or a legit feud will sort of help develop how the characters are going to behave. Like, if they're petty people, that's there's a. I always lean towards comedy, so if it's not comedic, like. Totally step in, but my immediate reaction is like, that's hilarious. Like, these petty, petty people. It's, I mean, I feel like blood feeds are usually petty. Um, but yeah, you, there's a lot to work with here. I, I think this is a really good idea to work with, um, especially given how all the character relationships and character traits are going to filter into what ends up happening on stage you know is she she's a homely woman is she awkward or is she charismatic um how do other people feel about her how do other people tend to treat her and i'm, I'm genuinely asking i admittedly i haven't really worked it all out That's, yet that uh, is okay just like she is a uh woman in the regency england which i believe does not have that much mobility but she she wants to be like uh she wants to be like the people in pride and prejudice and okay. those other stories so yeah. she sees herself as that and she'll go and make it so great so she's sort of um i don't watch a ton of like this style of show but i feel like this this is a thing i've seen before where it's like the homely woman has like ambitions yeah, to be, like, rich and, like, in that, like, aristocratic realm, like, higher than, than she is currently. Um, great. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot to work with this, with this idea, like, specifically um, with this class. Be- just because the, those relationships between those characters and the character traits are going to be, like, constantly at conflict because it is, like, a, a Regency era thing. Um, okay, great. We'll do, um, um, nachos, three possible ideas, pizza delivery guy murdered during complex plot involving bank robberies. I watched this documentary. It, I found it so upsetting. A scavenger hunt and a homemade explosive device. There's a documentary about this? Yeah, I think it's on uh, Netflix. Yeah, the movie 30 Minutes or Less is somewhat based on this as well. Oh, yeah, oh, okay. that's like a fictionalized just, version? Just yeah. skip that one then, <laughs> I guess. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, a lot of plays, I don't think there's a play version of this, so if you want to write this as theater, I think that would be actually kind of awesome. Um, okay. Well, let's say he he has, like, 
he's maybe he's in the bank and he has the device around the neck and there's like the ticking time bomb built in and like there's people in the bank and they're locked in somehow and the whole thing takes place like in that time you probably have to get him off stage before the thing explodes because you can't really do explosions on stage but they, there's something there i don't think it's infeasible to do um heroin addict former marathon runner coaches a gifted teen living on the streets okay yeah that's good because um there's um the character dynamic and the power dynamic sort of built in there right um um there's the camaraderie where they've both experienced like street life but then there's um interesting what what do you picture their relationship is like do you picture it's like um um oh okay so i'm curious like how do they meet you're talking about the people in the pizza thing or the other oh the the heroin oh, addicts sorry. and um oh yeah <clears throat> uh i would picture them meeting on the street you know he this guy's um an addict and mm -hmm. um like, you know, this is somebody who's like in his world or, you know, newly part of that, that world of people who live in, you know, kind of uh, squats or mm -hmm. like shelters, temporary shelters and stuff. Um, so uh, like uh, when they meet, what is the first thing that is said? Um, I don't know if you're talking, but I can't hear. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. No. Yeah. Good question. I have no, yeah, I have no idea. I mean, yeah. maybe, um, you know, Wanna something buy some drugs? <laughs> or <laughs> like something we wouldn't expect, you know, something totally. Just say different. no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, like something like that feels more mundane, like somebody might say in a, in a normal situation, but it's a really, mm -hmm. you know, w crazy, like, scene that, so it feels out of place, you know, like, um, I mm -hmm. don't know. Uh, is this for, um, uh, uh, I assume this is for a movie, not for a, a theater script? I mean, it could be for a theater script. I think it could work. Um, I mean, yeah, theater. these are just... These are just, I mean, things that I threw out that might seem like they might work for a play, but, it, you know, I have, I don't have, <clears throat> um, like, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not sure if it could work or not, but. Um, I think it could totally work. Um, so mm -hmm. to um, transfer it to the theater space, I would suggest really thinking about the voices of each character. Um, um, which I don't know. It's like um, interesting to get to get log lines like this because um, uh, it's it's interesting because I, I can tell like um, with the lo with the log lines, your brains are also like they work differently than mine. You know, um, your brains are very prompted to think of like a premise. Um, so what what I would suggest is just maybe you could write. Um, I don't know how um, quickly. Um, somebody who's new to playwriting c could write a 10 minute play, but maybe you just don't think about plot at all and just mm -hmm. write like a scene where they're just talking. It doesn't even have to be anything to do with like what you end up wanting to be in the script. Let's say they like got a pizza together and sat in a restaurant. Like how do they talk to each other? What are the things that they say to each other? Um, does she look up to him? Does he, what, what is their power dynamic? You know, um, um, yeah, I mean, I guess, like, I just pictured it, like, it would seem really interesting to try to show, like, a marathon on a stage, you know, like someone <laughs> running in a marathon, you that know, that seems be, really interesting. That could be interesting. A lot of times, the, the way that um, somebody is shown running on stage is um, they'll, they'll run in place, kind of like in, mm -hmm. in improv scenes, you'll see people are running in place, so it's implied that they're moving forward. Um, so you'd want this to, to subsequently have a marathon. Um, or like um, a lot of I, running, I guess. Can I weigh in really quick? And I just want to, because Andrew's about to leave, and I just wanted to answer a question that I think Andrew might have for the course, and several other students here. What would you say to students who have a script that they're trying, that is already written, that they're trying to adapt into play as Morgan? Is that going to feel like something that would work here or no? I think that could work. Um, my suggestion would be 
to sort of uh, like take take uh, what we did today in class and macro. Um, take the whole script, maybe cut almost all of your characters and all of your scenes and choose a scene that you really like and see if, and, and we'll, again, we're gonna talk about next class, how to stretch out dialogue and have it occur 60 minutes, one scene. Um, think about how you can have just two of those characters maybe interacting and dig deeply into their relationship in just one scene. So um, you might have a script with like car crashes and explosions and marathons. Those are kind of hard to stage. Uh, I would say a marathon is, is going to be pretty hard to stage. I'm not saying it can't be done. Um, you just have to get creative with it. Um, but um, I would suggest a lot of the things that happen in your script might have to be t spoken about in monologue. Um, so if there is an explosion, you can still have that explosion. But this is where Im audience imagination comes in. You might just have to discuss discuss the explosion and the explosion is the character's emotions about the explosion because that's what a theater audiences like to see is it really really intense emotion and it'll have the ex the same effect as an explosion would on tv just sit there in the audience and see the character recount the how the trauma of the explosion it's gonna be it's gonna be just as explosive <laughs> so you're sort of saying to be ready to completely sort of reimagine this as a play and not to just expect to copy and, and sort of do one-to-one -one what, what, whatever you had in the movie or show on the it, stage yeah exactly i'm actually kind of having the opposite problem of this right now as i'm trying to take a play that i wrote and turn it into a movie but the play is 90 pages in the exact same location so i'm trying to think i'm taking the monologues that were written and I'm making them into scenes and things that happen in different places. Um, and, you know, cutting back and forth in time and stuff. And um, uh, so I'm almost having the opposite problem, if that helps anybody. Um, yeah, I would suggest uh, reading plays, like read a bunch of plays mm -hmm. um, and sort of learn, especially for, for the uh, your guys' purposes, it might be helpful to read staged versions it's like play versions of movies um uh let me think like what's one that's both there's this movie Beetlejuice just came out i really like that one yeah that's a musical right connor knows a lot oh, more about yeah. musicals than i do um there's oh my gosh hang on i'm gonna google it really quick <laughs> there's this one script i like it's a novel a play and um a movie. Um, I gotta head to lab, um, so I'll just say thanks so much for coming, folks. We're a little over time, so um, next week, uh, same time, 2 p.m., and um, Morgan can work with you more on your specific ideas for this next six weeks. The goal is to have a finished show by the end of the six weeks. That's not doesn't have to be full length. It might just be a 10-minute version. It might just be a half hour, um, and uh, she can focus more on that for next time. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to head to lab. Uh, thanks for coming, folks. Uh, and feel free to, I mean, if you want to keep running for a few minutes, then that's totally cool. Yeah, just uh, post in the chat really quick if you want me to, to hang out. Um, or if, if anybody's hanging out, just post in the chat real quick. I'll, I'll stay and hang out with you. Um, but if not, goodbye to the people who are leaving. Thank you so much. I'm so stoked that people came. Last night I was like... <laughs> I was like, what if nobody comes? <laughs> Stay for next week. Okay, so Logan wants to stay. I'll stay. I'll stay hang out. Uh, I'll stay and hang out with Logan and uh, um, I don't know how to pronounce that. Ari. Um, cool. So, uh, Logan, could you just like repost your idea so that I can check oh, it out? Oh, is it fine if I just say my idea? Yeah, that would, that would actually be even better. Okay, yeah. So I had like a couple because I'm not really sure if one of them will work because it just, as you said, is based off an interaction. Mm -hmm. So like one interaction I found really compelling. I actually identified it by this like dumb meme where it was like 
Yes. Um, have you ever watched Breaking Bad? Yes, I've watched Breaking Bad. Yeah, okay. I love uh, it. You know, you know, like the the Hank meme when he's like one of them. He's like has this big dumb Joker smile, and then in the next one, he's like this big like glare. I want to say um, like I've probably seen it, but I don't recall it. I'll, but, I'll show you. but I know the meme format. Like it's happened. Okay, so it's in the it's in the chat. Let's see. Oh, did someone post it already? Oh, I just assumed uh, somebody did because because I heard like a ding. But, um, okay. uh, yeah, there's like no a the frequent put... meme format of like happy then upset. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it was like this, but like the two things. Oh, like, that's that's not Hank. That's yeah. Wait, that is Hank. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, there's a lot of bold white guys with beards. And yeah, like, kind of with beards and stuff. <laughs> um, um, so, like, the happy one was, like, um, went, like, cleaning your room by yourself, and then the miserable one was, like, when someone else asks you to clean your room. And oh, just, like, yeah. Um, kind of funny, because it's, like, okay, it's, like, the same action, but just, like, because someone else is making you do it, it's so, like, terrible. It feels so terrible for some reason. Exactly, and yeah. And, like, I kind of identified it with, like, oh, um, sometimes when I, like, str um, when I struggled in school, um... Like, I could start doing the, okay, okay, well, I'm struggling in school, I need to do the work, and I start doing the work, and my dad, he's, like, you know, just, like, pretty traditional, very serious about education, so if he hears I'm doing bad in school, he, he would, like, get very upset, and I'd be mm. like, you need to focus on school, you need to, and then, like, I remember a couple of times, I was sitting down about to do the work, and then he just comes in, and he's like, you need to focus on school and all this stuff, and I'm like, well, fuck this shit, I'm not doing that. <laughs> That sounds so, like, like what all of, just... of being a teenager is like. Yeah, yeah, So uh, just, like, this kind of, like, um, well, I wanted to do, like, deeper than, like, what our actual is like, because it's, like, um, it's not, like, that dramatic, but um, just, like, a character who, like, a, a character who wants another character to succeed, but, like, they don't, like, approach the problem in the correct way for the other, other character. So then their encourage what what they think is encouragement actually is like causing the the second character to want to fail, so to speak. Oh, so that's be, actually perfect like, for this class. I yeah, think. so it could be something like school or any academic field or it could be like I think that'd be a little bit boring. It could be something like career or like rehab even. Um, yeah. And then another thing I was thinking of I was like developing this idea is like maybe it's like um if this was like more in the past it could be like a family trade or something like that so you know how like nowadays mm -hmm. like your dad and your mom are probably something completely different than you are profession wise mm -hmm. but in the past it was like usually the son of a butcher is a butcher the son of a carpenter is a carpenter mm -hmm. and so on and so forth so like maybe it's like the the character one so the younger character that um that i guess needs to succeed so to speak doesn't want to as much because they they don't they don't like like the character that the father is and they like they associate the success in the field with the like the profession with the personality or i like maybe there could be like history of like abuse or something like that so then there's like a negative on a tape like they're it's because they relate the two things that are not necessarily related so then it's like the more effort is put in by the the character A, the more even though it's like good intention, the more character B will actually fail. Yeah. Yeah, I I think you're gonna like this class because I'm gonna like take those dynamics and like teach you how to like stretch it out into a full play. Um so there's this thing called mapping in improv where you take, like, the concept of a character dynamic. Were you the person who said they were taking improv classes, or was it, was it somebody else? Uh, yeah, yeah. I just, like, I'm in, like, the first couple of weeks. So. Okay, yeah. Or, so you, you might not learn this for, for a while, um, and depending on what school you're learning, maybe not at all. But um, So there's this concept called mapping in improv, where you take an interaction, and you can map it onto multiple things. It... it it normally would take me a while to explain, but I'm just going to explain it very briefly and then maybe try to find, like, a video or something that I can send you. Um, but, uh, okay, so let's say let's say that. Uh, a mentor is teaching a mentee. This is the barest bones of, of 
what you said. A mentor is teaching a mentee. I wish I could think of a character trait in one word that could explain like that feeling of like, like genuinely enjoying the passion but hating authority to a point where you like self sabotage. Um, so yeah. we'll just say for now, for 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 right now, I'm just gonna say stubborn, and um, like uh, the the mentor and mentee, and this character's trait is stubborn, and this character's trait is um, pushy. So there's that dynamic there of uh, stubborn and pushy. Um, you can take that and map that onto any situation. So like, let's say you start a scene in improv and it's um, a mom and a daughter and the mom is like, you need to do your homework. And the daughter is like, no. Um, you can take that and you can map it on and it's funny. It's like, okay, uh, well, what if like an astronaut did this? They're like, you need to attach your oxygen tank. And the astronaut goes, no, no, it's comedy, right? Um, uh, so, so basically what you have is interactions, but you, you haven't mapped yet onto them a specific interaction so um i would just um if this will help you with improv too is like thinking specifically like what are character traits that would be funny or like um with within this dynamic of like um this person who um doesn't want to do something just because they're told to even though they would normally do it what's like a funny um like job that that could happen at, or like a funny like relationship that they could have, um, and and I would suggest just maybe like brainstorming things like that, and um, because after that, once you figure out like what their relationship could be, after that you're just you're just juggling. You can think of all this information as balls in the air that you're just playing with. It's so fun. Um, does that did I help at all? Yeah, that totally that totally makes sense. Okay, um, yeah. If I wanted to lead, if I wanted to like lean sort of more like tragic what, mm -hmm. um, what would I think of instead um so like I said I always lean comedic so tragic I think I think what you had with the profession idea is really good um being like uh it would be tragic if um you know like the kid didn't want it genuinely wanted to do the profession but then they were sort of kept out of it by authority I've experienced that myself Self, actually as I've been in um I've had friends who like they genuinely enjoy participating in like an organization and they're genuinely passionate about the hobby or like the the skill that the organization supports but the authority within the organization is so frustrating and the culture is so bad that they give up on this passion because of just other people um so like what's an example with that um Fighting with my families. I didn't finish that movie, but it, it's just what I'm thinking of. It's like a wrestling, right? Um, um, in that movie, she really wants to be a wrestler, but then becoming a wrestler is frustrating because of the coaches. Um, uh, I don't. Eh, I don't finish that movie. That's not a good example. Um, just because I haven't finished it. Um, but I think high school is a really good example. Um, what else? Yeah, there's something there. I'll, if I think of any, I'll, I'll certainly send it your way. Um, but I think ultimately, because you're the one with the image in your head, if you just hang on to that image, like as you're going through life, maybe you journal a bit. I journal like crazy. I have like a shelf full of journals. If you just journal it out, do some brain maps, be thinking about it when you're driving or um, just like throughout life, it'll come to you. I think I really think it'll come to you. Um, we'll move on to... Um, who is the, the next person? Um, Ari? I hope that helps. Um, Ari, yeah. did you have one? Yeah, I did have one um, actually for you. It, it It's way back. I tried to mention it like 17 times and nobody, it didn't catch on. So sorry. It's like so hard for me to monitor the chat. <laughs> Yeah, it's Thanks so much, basically Nick. the idea is it's about a monk who mm -hmm. happens to be female because they don't recognize, th th they, they have trouble recognizing this one non-human species gender. Oh, so it's a monk in like a fantastical world where there's um, like yeah. non-human species? 
Kind of like yeah. uh, like like a Tolkien world or like a like that Tolkien world, but Dungeons even Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons, Tolkien, some, something like that, but with a, with a different kind of mythology. Okay, so so it's like within that genre, but it's like your own sort of like version of it. That's my own take on it, and mm-hmm. she's she, and basically she felt she was her mother was uh was falling from the sky and. And she, she she got impaled from above, and yeah, stuff happened, and yeah. Yeah, so that's a backstory. That's the backstory for it, mm-hmm. and I haven't figured out what, who. She, kinda. Yeah, I'm 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 thinking about it. Yeah, you'll get there. I think I think this guy's actually good for those kinds of ideas because. Um, what we want to do is flesh um, her out as a character. So so far, you've got a couple of things, which is good. Her, she's got trauma. Um, her mom was impaled, um, and she's got um, this thing that she's passionate about, which is being a monk. And um, did you say is she in the species that the gender is not like understood or recognized, or is she outside of that? She's in a species where gender, where the gender is kind of, or 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 gender. She's in a species that's more like birds. It's hard to tell which gender unless you get really up close. Oh, okay. So that's actually super interesting. So it's kind of like... like so yeah, her species is like a winged humanoid species, but yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, so and you've got like the world kind of around it. So I would suggest um, what might help you flesh yeah, her out. And the 90 kingdoms. Yeah, what, what I suggest, uh, what might help you flesh out this character is thinking, um, like, what's, so, um, what's, like, a situation she could be in that would cause, um, her passions to be challenged? Or maybe a scene where she's, like, defending her profession to, um, somebody, or, or somebody's, Mad at her for, for being I a monster. I think she's... She, she's... Well, maybe she's not... Maybe she left the monks and became a friar or something. Or who knows? That's cool. Yeah, I mean, so she's, she's on this, like, career trajectory. Um, yeah, I think And her, became, like, a... And, but, yeah, I don't know. I'm thinking about it. Yeah, I keep thinking about it. Um, I would say with with um, play plays re- playwriting on stage, um, the the bird people thing might be tricky, but it can be done with maybe their puppets or really cool costumes. Um, or maybe wires or yeah. Yeah. Um, so wires are possible. That's true. They ha- if they're used only sparingly. Exactly. Um, like, like like the lightsaber fights in old Star Wars. Exactly. For for our purposes, I tend to think very small budget. So it's like it's not guaranteed that you're gonna get. Yeah, I wrote a play. Yeah. I wrote a romance play once with uh, two people who were inside who who didn't know who each other was beyond their spacesuits. And then they, uh, oh, yeah. they kind of devolved into an enemy mind situation after they took them off. Interesting. That's fun. You thought they might, like, want to hook up or something? Or how about... Yeah. Um, yeah, you seem like a person with a lot of cool ideas. And who knows, but yeah, they're, they're totally... Yeah, their civilizations are at odds with each other. Great. Um, so I'm just going to see if there's... Was there anybody else... Post real quick if there's anybody else left. I think there's there's only like three people left in the chat. One of them's me. One of them's Nacho. Um, let's see. Uh, that looks like me. Yeah. Or or uh, Missy. Did you have one? Or um. I wait. I think you got all Oops. all the uh, all the ideas. Oops. Choop 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 choop. Oh. I was wanting the you. I was wanting the Google Drive URL last. Oh yeah. I'll talk to Connor about that. Um. So um. He 
he'll i'm gonna like get the recording of this and then we'll post it in probably in a couple hours is that okay yeah that's fine okay. yeah and if and if connor doesn't if connor doesn't um consent that's fine yeah i think i think yeah, we'll have i mean a video i understand then, uh yeah we'll have a i think this video the video of this class is definitely going up um and then probably the slides too um so yeah we'll see um Probably, at, probably by the end of today, it'll it'll be up. Um, and if not, feel free to to message me. Um, all right. And if that's it, then I guess that's the end of class. Thank you guys so much for coming. Like, <laughs> I'm this went um, I think pretty well. Um, yeah, great job, Morgan. Yeah. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna push. Um, stop recording. What was that? Oh, just it, was it clear like where to, how to upload it, or do you need any help from me or anything? Um, so I just upload the recording into the Google Drive with the slides, right? And yeah, into the where it says course videos folder. Cool, sounds good. All right, awesome. goodbye recording. Bye. Okay. Bye. Stop Thanks again. <laughs>